Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Ben Stewart, who just brought the message on Psalm 1, The Pursuit of Happiness. Welcome, Ben. Hi, thanks. All right, well, um, this message certainly generated a lot of questions. Great. Great. So we're going to cool. be taking a look at um, quite a few things from what you talked about today in Psalm 1. Um, the number one most popular question that we need answered first, though, is what is the title of the book that you referenced that you yeah. used in your trip to Italy? We're, we're dying to know. <laughs> That's great. So glad people asked. Uh, that was uh, Rick Steves is his name, and he does uh, all different parts of Europe. Rick Steves. Okay, got yeah. it. All right, so. for those of you who are going to Italy, Trust Rick. He's good. He's good, very good. Grab the book. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get into a few more questions. Okay. Um, we had several come in around um, getting into the Bible and getting into God's Word. Whether you are a new believer and you're new to Christianity or you've never really studied the Bible before, where do you start? Right. And then secondly, if you've been studying the Bible for a long time and you've been in prayer but you just don't feel like you're getting the answers, can you answer questions around that? Yeah, absolutely. Where do you start? Um, <clears throat> I would say um, one thing that's interesting, I mean, you look at like the early church, most of them were illiterate. So the idea of just me and my Bible alone was not how they worked out spirituality, which is pretty impressive if you think hmm. the entire Roman Empire changed under this community and they didn't necessarily have private devotions. What they had were frequent connections with each other, mm. speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so what you see often in the Bible is we're coming around the words of God together. We're speaking the words of God together. So if someone's saying, it's just me and my Bible and I'm totally lost, I go, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I think they would have read the Bible alone if they could have. I think it's good to read the Bible alone. But I would say the first thing is study the Bible in community. Mm. Um, so get in a small group would be the first thing uh, at your church where people are studying the Bible together. Uh, and then in your own study, I mean, definitely read the Bible on your own, but add in commentaries because that's a way of inviting people in that have mm -hmm. studied it. They can give you insight. There's a website, and I'm totally serious about the name. It's called bestcommentaries.com, and it really is the best commentaries out there. It's unbelievable. Uh, and I would recommend going there and checking those out. Um, Beyond that, I would say something that some people feel maybe is a little insulting, but I found profound, our family's reading through it again, is the Jesus Storybook Bible by mm -hmm. Sally Lloyd-Jones. It kind of, it, it's written for kids, but she's helping you see how the whole Bible is one story. Right, my kids too. It's extremely helpful mm -hmm. for everybody. I know college ministers that take believers through it uh, of all ages because it's so helpful in saying, oh, that's how all this fits. Mm -hmm. And so I would read that as part of it too, you know. Uh, I would say for us at Breakaway, we developed an app that you can download our Breakaway app. It's a shameless plug, but it's free. Come That's on. Awesome. Um, but uh, we give people Bible study tools of how to mm -hmm. study because that'll mm -hmm. help you. And from there, I would say John is a great gospel to read. Mm -hmm. Ephesians would be a good epistle to read. Take little bits at a time. Uh, but you can download our app, and I'll give you a lot of details on how to study. But first and foremost, I would say do it, do it in community. And then when you're alone, get some good resources. That's awesome. We have a couple of girl groups doing your Engage the Word. Awesome. Together. See, there yeah. you go. So, Come on. Thanks. Good. Um, get both of those. Okay. So uh, let's talk about a couple other questions. Um, one, two or three, all around the same thing. People, how do you minister to people in your life who are not following the way of the Lord? Would mm -hmm. be considered under what we were talking about today as wicked, whether it's your spouse Mm -hmm. um, someone in your close relations with, and then the relationship, you know, as a wife with a spouse who's not right. walking with the Lord. Um, yeah. What do you have to say? Um, well, in a short question, I probably don't have enough time to do justice to wanting to emphasize empathizing with that person. That's a very that is a difficult spot, and I think having other believers around that can love and encourage you because that is challenging. When you say the person I'm bound closest to isn't going the same direction, it creates a lot of tension. 
and what do you do with that? And the good news is for, for the person who's married to someone that says this person's not a believer, the Bible does speak to that. 1 Corinthians 7, mm -hmm. 1 Peter 3 speak directly to that. 1 Corinthians 7 is, as far as it depends on you, stay. And 1 Peter, Peter talks about it. He's, and, and specifically, he's talking about wives. He says, wives, be subject to your husbands, even if they do not obey the word, that you, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see you, your respectful and pure conduct. And so he's talking about it's going to be difficult, but as much as you can, live in a way that what they see is your respectful and pure conduct, which is really interesting. He says that treat them in a way that they feel respected, that you're not uh, always chiding them about what they're not doing hmm. so that the basic message to them is you're not enough or you're not hmm. sufficient. As much as you are able to, what I tell people, and this goes for friends, not just spouses, is find the things in their life you can celebrate and celebrate those as much as you can. You know? So I would say with common friends, that you say that person's living a destructive life, my spouse is not following the Lord, I'd say find the things around their life that you can celebrate and celebrate those. Hey, you're good at this. I love watching you do that. Hey, when you did that, that was so awesome. Thank you. Not with a hint of, and you should maybe do that more. You know, like just, just mm -hmm. celebrate them with nothing attached uh, because people feel valued. And then I think you ask honest questions. You care about them. It, it, all this fits under the general category of grace. Uh, I am as gracious to them as I can be. Celebrating what I can celebrate in their life. Loving for them. Anticipating their needs and meeting them. Showing that person I care. And then in this text it says, and live a pure conduct, but live a holy life. Because as time goes on, they're going to see that works mm -hmm. better. Yep. And he's saying, stay in there and be a display. That's a very hard thing to do, mm -hmm. but do your best at it. And, uh, and there's a lot more I should say, but that's kind of the general category. So I would say don't do it alone, but when you're in there, love them sincerely and then live a pure life. And uh, I think that's what helps people. And then, like Peter said, be prepared to give an answer. Uh, I tell college students that all the time. They'll come to Christ in college and come home with a sermon, and it never lands right. It's always insulting to their non-Christian parents. Mm -hmm. I say, don't even do it. So you go home, and you be respectful to them. You listen to their advice because they have something to offer. You obey them. You honor them. Then you do the dishes. Mm -hmm. You mow the lawn without asking. They're going to go, what is happening? <laughs> you know, because that's loving somebody. And as they see your life over time, Usually what I find with parents is they minimize it, they mock it, they're mystified by it, and then they begin to ask about it. And then they want to hear. And then they, yeah, <laughs> over time, as you stay consistent um, and uh, they see this is a beautiful way to live. But uh, hang good. in there. Good, yeah. en good encouragement. Um, so this question came in. I suffer from bipolar disorder, and when I read Psalm 1, I feel like it, the second half describes my life. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult for me to believe that God sees me differently, and it's very hard for me to see myself differently. So from someone who's coming from this perspective or this struggle, um, where's the hope in this when your mind kind of works different than what we're talking about in yeah. Psalm 1? Well, I would say Psalm 1 in some ways feels too simple. Here's two roads beyond this one, not that one. And some people go, oh my gosh, life's way more complex than that. And you go, yeah, that, that's why it starts there. But there's 150 Psalms. And you see people that love God truly wrestle deeply in the Psalms. And so I would say keep reading them because you see where there's not as much of the grittiness of life in Psalm 1. It shows up in later ones. But what also shows up is a God that doesn't give up on us. Mm even when we're failing in every capacity. So um, I would quote, there, there were, uh, someone mentioned that question to me, and I just want to read over you two Psalms. Psalm 78. Psalm 78 is about how God loves his people. And it's basically a history lesson. And he gave them his law, and he loved them. And then it just recounts all the way they blew him off, were self-destructive, hurt their kids, basically made a mess of their lives, and how God always moved back towards them with grace. And it says in it, 
Yet he, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity, did not destroy them, restrained his anger, did not stir up his wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. And then Psalm 103 says, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we're dust. And so twice the psalm says that he knows what you are. He knows that you are but flesh. He knows our frame that we are but dust. What's it saying there? I know you're weak. I know you're frail. I know the physical ins and outs of that frailty. I'm aware of it. And I move towards it like a father who compassionately loves his child. So I would say if that inner voice is presenting to you a God that's other than that, a compassionate and patient father, make war against that mentality with the truth of mm -hmm. Psalm 103. And then again, I would say don't fight that alone. Often we can read the Bible on our own and try to make ourselves believe it, but that voice of condemnation is so loud, we need some other people to speak it to mm -hmm. us. No, you are forgiven. No, you are loved. And hearing that from another human being makes it easier to believe. If that person external from me cares about me, it's easier to believe that he does too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I don't think God is... Uh, harsh or cruel with those who struggle. Now there's a lot to being bipolar that, that we're not getting into by saying it that way, but that's where I'd say to start. John Bunyan is someone I think has been really helpful too. He, he didn't have that language of bipolar. He was an old Puritan guy, but he struggled deeply. And you can read some of uh, his grace abounding to the chief of sinners was about his struggle and ultimately finding rest in the grace of God that abounds even for the chief of all sinners. Okay. And this goes a, a, a lot along with the next question, which is, what does God say about someone who decides to go so far from Him that they choose to take their own life? Uh, yeah. Um, I would say um, taking your own life is roundly condemned by the Bible. It, whenever you see someone do it, it's presented as the wrong decision, a bad way to go, not a good thing to do with your life. So I, I want to be clear, God is not happy with that. Your life's a gift and it's not yours to take, you know. Does that mean, so if you do, no matter what God was doing in your life before, it's a direct, go direct to hell card. There have, have been traditions that have said something, that's the unpardonable sin. I would not say that. I don't think the New Testament presents any unpardonable sin. Jesus does talk about a sin that's not forgiven. But if you read it in context in the gospel, the sin that's not forgiven is what? The rejection of him. Mm. Not believing that I'm the Messiah. He says, if you reject the spirit of God is working through me to show miracles, to testify that I am God's Messiah. You reject the spirit, reject me. You've rejected God. There's nothing for you. So that's what he presents as the unpardonable sin, rejection of Jesus. Can someone truly know Jesus and in a moment of despair make a horrible choice? I, I think so. Would God condemn them? I don't think so. There's no clear passage that says he would. So I think there's grace and there's hope, but there is in, there's no permissiveness. So if someone's struggling, they need to go get help. Uh, that is not the way out that God is looking for you to take. And so with this, we kind of go back to the, the last question kind of brings us back to the theme of Psalm 1 and the pieces. Um, does our desire to pursue worldly happiness, is that what leads to self-destruction or self-destructive behaviors? I would say the word worldly is important there. Like, should we pursue happiness? The answer is yes it matters greatly what object you're pursuing it in, you know? Um, and so God wants you to be happy. Mm -hmm. God wants you to pursue happiness, but in Him. And ultimately, that's where true happiness is found. That's what Psalm 1 is about. It's the misuse of God's world 
the misuse of your life in your pursuit of happiness that will be destructive for you. So yeah, I, I don't know specifically what they're asking mm -hmm. in that question, but I would ask, what are you looking for? And um, I promise you, God knows how his world best fits together. And he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, you love me and you love people. And I promise you, you lose your life for my sake. You're going to find it. He said, if you, if you self-sacrifice, put yourself under me and trust me, your life's going to end up in a way better place than you can even imagine. You go, no, I want to do it my way. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end is death. So I don't know how to be more specific because I don't know the specific question, but I would say your pursuit of happiness is not a sin. Make sure you know what object you're pursuing it in. God wants you to pursue happiness in him, mm. right? Yep. That's the idea. Awesome. Well, all of these were great applications yeah. of Psalm 1 and, and different struggles. Um, Good thank you for being with us again today. Sure. It's always a pleasure to it's have fun. you with us. And thank you for all your questions today. We'll see you back here next week for Postscript. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.